could have stayed home tonight. If you'd stayed home, you would have missed it. You would have missed it. I'm thankful you're here. I'm glad to be here tonight at First Baptist Church. Enjoyed that. Enjoyed worshiping the Lord. Every time I get to worship the Lord with other like-minded Christians. Well, we're going to finish up tonight a series on purpose that I started now 10 weeks ago, 11 weeks ago now actually, on uh, the top 10 ways to ruin your children. I would typically not finish this on a Sunday night, except for two reasons. One, I wanted to get done before, before the summer preaching conference began, and number two, as I began praying this last week, it fit, well, I think, well into this day, which is Father's Day. Right, Father's Day, and it's only fitting that, you know, we beat up on the dads a little bit on Father's Day, of which I am one. I think you'll find in this last, these last thoughts, these last lessons, Again, the application for all of us. I do have a couple of dad jokes for you. Not because I believe they're funny, but because I feel like I have to say them, because it's Father's Day. Don't shake your head at me, Brother Ash. I have no choice. What do you call a fish with four eyes? A fish. Brother Shaw, don't you laugh too much over there. I've got more. (laughs) Brother Mark says, come on. It's not good. Not good. The dad asked his his son, son, where do French fries come from? And the kid quickly responded, from France. He said, no, they come from Greece. (laughs) One more. One more. The dad was in a stern conversation with his children. He said to his children, listen, children, you need to learn to embrace your mistakes. And they quickly ran over and gave their dad a hug. <laughs> there you go. i am now done my duty to fathers on Father's Day. I am released from that weight that was on my shoulders. All right, I am guiltless now. Uh, in, in Christendom, as before other pastors, I have now told some dad jokes on Father's Day. Tonight, if, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. 1 Corinthians 16. You're like, boy, pastor, that's not in the notes, so you can't do that. I realize that. So as we come to this last lesson on, on Lord willing, you know, the tongue-in-cheek, how not to ruin our children, it seemed a little bit fitting that it ended up on Father's Day. I'd read a a statistic this past week, how that Mother's Day was historically very well attended at church, and Father's Day historically well unattended at church. I thought that was intriguing that that kind of idea would be the case, that on Mother's Day, moms would want to go to church, and on Father's Day, dads would rather stay home. It would maybe sum up the problem in many homes, could it not? And so, dads, tonight, I'm going to challenge you and challenge all of us in this last concept, in this last series and the top ten ways to ruin your kids. A couple of preliminary thoughts. Yeah, hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 16. Throughout this series, my intent was never to make you feel badly or like failures apart from the truth from God's word. Sometimes God's word convicts me and makes me feel badly. That's okay. No matter where you're at in the process, whether you're a current dad with, I mean, I'm sorry, a dad with current children in the home, whether you're a dad with kids out of the home, whether you're not a dad and no plans to be a dad, um, hopefully these lessons and these thoughts have been a help to you. If along the way you have realized some issues, problems, Things that you have done, moms and dads, anyone as Christians, please do not sit there and think, wow, I've ruined it. There is no hope for me. Because if someone came to us and said, you know, Pastor, here I am, 58 years old, and I just got saved. I have wasted my life for Jesus Christ. What would we tell them? We'd say, well, you know what? Don't 
worry about the past now. Paul said that, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark. We'd say, listen, okay, you did. You made some mistakes. But today, live for Jesus Christ. Would we not, would we not all say that? And every day thereafter, and if they continue to say, boy, I'm just wasting my life, wasting my life, we'd say, listen, done. You can't change that, right? It's done. It's finished. It's written. But God's not finished with you yet. And so you may be sitting there saying, wow, pastor, everything you said, I'm guilty of. I don't think that's the case, but you may be in your mind thinking of that. Well, listen, wherever you at, wherever you're at, if you're Fallen, the Bible says, a just man falls seven times, yet riseth up again. And so grab a hold of God's truth and say, listen, from this point on, I'm going to be the parent. I'm going to be the mom. I'm going to be the dad that I'm supposed to be today. And sure, my kids may be 35. My kids may be 3.5. Anywhere in there, today, follow Jesus Christ. Wherever you're at. Remember those four principles, the one being that we're all going to make mistakes. And if the mark, if, the, if, the, um, if it takes a perfect parent to raise a perfect child, then our children at First Baptist Church will be hopelessly imperfect. And the children in the Howell house will be hopelessly imperfect. The children in your house, because there is no such thing as a perfect parent. But Dad, specifically tonight, I want to challenge you it's time that we have some men as Christians, as husbands, as dads, as teenagers, as sons. Now, ladies, you don't, you don't get off with a free pass, but right now, men, this world, this world needs to see a shining example of what a Christian man looks like and acts like. A Christian man, no matter the age, no matter the, the, the place in life, whether he's a husband now or still a teenager or a young man or now an older man, no matter where you're at, a man who is defined by a man, by his actions toward others and his relationship with God. A man that echoes the words of Joshua, as for me and my house, no matter how many people that entails, it may be just you. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So men to say, listen, this is what we're doing. We're going to church on Father's Day. I realize I'm preaching to the choir. I realize that. But I want to encourage you to be men. I know there's many people here online as well. And most likely this is at the TV screen as well. Listen, we need some men who will say, my house, we're going to serve Jesus Christ. In my house, we're going to have some family devotions. In my house, we're going to seek God's face. We're going to make decisions that please the Lord. We're going to be a, we're going to be a house that honors Jesus Christ because the man, all right, the husband, the dad, whatever it may be, because the man, the male, says, listen, I'm going to follow God, and the rest of you can follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. Your dads may need to put your phones away sometimes. Turn it off. Turn the TV off. Little button, click. Turn it right off. Some of you may have to quit working some overtime so you can be a dad at home, a husband at home. I'm not against overtime, but, but you're not called. We're not called to be in overtime. I'm not against it. You understand what I'm saying? We're called to different responsibilities in life, it's time for some men. 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 13. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Now, why does he say quit you like men? He doesn't say quit you like some animal, like an elephant, like a hippopotamus, like a bulldog. Doesn't say that, does he? Doesn't even use the female gender. Again, no offense to the ladies here. There's something about male stubbornness. Something about male stubbornness. We are going to fix this. This six foot box will fit into my five foot trunk. Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm at this job. 
was years back, well, many years ago now, we'd just gotten married, and um, my brother-in-law had purchased uh, my first gas grill. It was his wedding gift to me, to my, me, me and my wife a gas grill. So I went down to Sears and bought a Kenmore grill. I got there to pick it up, and I, had, I was driving my wife's Honda Civic. <laughs> You'd chuckle. You'd be a man if you drive that too. I'll tell you what. I had no problem. It got a lot, got good gas mileage, and it got me to point A to point B, albeit in three hours. <laughs> and I got there, and I had this gas grill, and it was in a big box. I pull up to the loading dock, and the guy comes out, and he says, that's not fitting in there. Now, men, what would your response be? Come on, what would your response be? Thank you. Thank you. There's some men in here. Oh, yes, it is. All right, if I had somebody with a truck, at that point, I was not calling them. That grill was going in that Civic. He said, it's not going to go. He said, I've been, he said, I've been working here for fill in the blank so many years, I forget what it was now, probably 5,000 years or something like that. Some random number of years. I've working here for this many years. That is not going in there. I'm not, and now I'm like, yes, it is. I began to unpack the grill piece by piece and shove it into every crevice of this Honda Civic that I could. When I got this whole grill inside the space of this Honda Civic, the man ran inside, ran inside and got other guys who work at the loading dock to come see what I'd done. And he came out and he said, look, it, I can't believe this guy fit this grill into this car. They come out there, wow, wow, right? And men, what do we do, men? That's right, I did. <laughs> you hiring? <laughs> I can fit things. There's something about some male stubbornness, right, men? Now, we find it in the most seemingly inopportune places and times, like putting a grill into the back of a Honda Civic. And somehow, we lose it when we come to spiritual things. Now, come on now, you know what I'm saying? We lose it when we come to spiritual things. All of a sudden, the, the tenacity and the fortitude that we had over here to get this thing solved, shoved in there, done, Coming to spiritual things, all of a sudden we're like the church mouse. What's wrong with us, men? It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. We need some men. As we look at this lesson, and I'll go briefly, I don't even know the time, I'm going to look at my watch tonight, all right? We're gonna, at the end, I'm going to ask for a commitment, men and women. Let's look at this tonight. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And those children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of, his, of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Lord, I pray you'd help us these next few minutes, that our hearts would be stirred, convicted, challenged, and corrected. Lord, thank you for the men here tonight. Lord, I... I'm privileged to serve in a wonderful church. Lord, I get to serve a wonderful Savior. But Lord, we ask your spirit would touch us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The last lesson night, number 10. If you want to ruin your kids, and some of you have already guessed the blank as you look down the blanks. I know you do that, and I don't mind that at all. If you want to ruin your kids, then be uncommitted. Then be uncommitted. The world is filled with uncommitted people. You find them at jobs. You find them making things. You can't find someone to stand behind a warranty right now, uncommitted. You find them in parents with kids. Unfortunately, you find them in marriages. You find them in churches. Three places that I think sometimes we see Uncommitment. They're uncommitted, first of all, they're the first blank in parenting. There are days I feel good and I'm a good parent. Days I feel tired and I'm a bad parent. Some blanks there. There's no consistency in discipline. Uncommitted. Sometimes parents will, will go on a rampage for a little bit. Now there are as parents, often there are times you have to readjust and realign and say, what's going on? My wife and I will 
often have conversations. How are the kids doing? What kind of things we need to focus on? What are they struggling with? I'm not talking about that. But, but there are times that parents are like, listen, this is the way it is. And they are like a drill sergeant. It lasts for about two weeks or a week. And then nothing happens. And they come back and no consistency in discipline. Second blank there, no consistency in discipleship. Parents, we are called to disciple our children, to raise them, as the Bible says, to fathers specifically, bring them up in the nurture and admonition, not of mechanical things, not of financial things, though those aren't bad. You're, hopefully your, your kids, boys and girls, know how to do some of those things, but of the Lord, of all those things, I hope they can deal with money and deal with it in a good way. I hope they can relationally deal with people and know how to, how to answer. And I hope they can work hard. It's a good thing. It's a, a thing of integrity. But they better know from you dads and you moms, they better know about Jesus Christ because of you, not just because you drop them off at church or at school. They need to hear from you. This is what God has taught me today. This is what God touched Daddy about. Boy, this is a blessing in my life, in Mom's life. You see him uncommitted in parenting. Second blank, top of the page there, uncommitted in a marriage relationship, uncommitted in marriage. They say that the statistic for the divorce is that 50% of all marriages will end in divorce. Apparently, that number has gone down the last few years, not because people are more committed, but because many people are now just not getting married and just cohabiting and living together. I've seen some statistics. I teach a marriage class, the young couples class, so I I'm often on these websites, look statistics and all these things, and I like those numbers. They, they tell me, uh, some surveys, that evangelical Baptists also tend to be about the same marriage statistic. Now, I don't think we see that quite here at First Baptist Church, and I'm thankful for that. But we'd be foolish to think that doesn't touch Baptists and evangelicals and save people. Commitment in marriage. At two weddings this weekend, Friday and Saturday, many of you came, and thank you for that. Rejoiced on both of them. Friday night to see Adam and Angela follow the Lord in marriage. What a blessing. A couple here with three kids up here. You say, Pastor, what's going on? You know what? They made some choice in life before that didn't please God. And then they said, we're going to please God. This is good. This is good. And they got married in this stage right here. Praise God. A couple following Jesus Christ. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I've said this in, in ceremonies, and your marriage vows, I believe, are the most sacred vows this side of heaven you'll ever make. I remember the first time I signed my life away on a mortgage, read every document. Brother Jeff, I think you were with me that day. Signed my life away, reading every document. A few houses later now, I've signed a number of mortgages now, uh, probably more than I can count right now. Do I read them now? Sometimes. Just, there we go, there we go, there we go. Mortgage is a pretty big commitment. Well, you mess up on a mortgage, they can, uh, they can do some things, right? But my marriage, those vows, sacred right there. Sacred, this side of heaven. I'm committed in marriage. Our focus sometimes becomes misaligned. Misaligned. Career, children, comfort. Or number three, uncommitted in spirituality. If you want to ruin your kids, be Uncommitted. Uncommitted as a parent, uncommitted to your spouse, and are committed, uncommitted in your spirituality. Be a half-hearted Christian. Be a convenient Christian. Be a conditional Christian. Be a comfortable Christian. Hey, when it works out, I'm here. When it doesn't, oh boy, bless God, there's live stream. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, I'm not making this up, am I? I'm like, well, Pastor, you may be stepping on some toes. I may be. Half hearted, conditional, convenient Christianity. Your kids, this lost world, doesn't need to see a half hearted Christian. They need to see someone who's sold out. Let me give you quickly some deceptive thoughts inside of this. Number one, sometimes we believe and feel like my choices only have 
limited effects. We mistakenly think that we can choose the consequences that blank there. We can choose what we do, but not what we get. We can choose what we do, but not what we get. You know that God has consequences built into life? The Bible says it this way. For whatsoever a man, help me, soweth, that shall he also reap. Now God is gracious in consequences and mercy. I'm so thankful for that. But God says if you plant corn, you get, right? If you plant apple trees, you get apple. If you plant commitment, you get commitment. The Bible says. Choices are in my control. Consequences are are out of my control. Dads, what you do, tremendous impact on your family. Financially, spiritually, relationally. Someone said this, that Christianity is one generation from becoming extinct. As we work in the school with the young people here in the youth group, I've been reminded that I don't look at them like the next generation. I'm looking at them beyond them. Like, will their grandkids be in church? Will their grandkids hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? As I raise my kids, it's not just about them. They'll make their choices, but I hope that their kids and kids' kids follow God. Down the road, long term, what I do has eternal effect and consequences. We believe we can still maintain a good situation in spite of our lack of commitment. We can make God secondary and think it will not affect the children. It will. Or we say that next little parenthesis, that next little statement, well, pastor, my situation is unique. My situation is unique. You know, you know, Pastor, if you knew where I sat, if you knew what I went through, then you would understand the choices that I have to make. Now, my friend, you don't owe me an explanation. I am not a Catholic priest. I don't forgive you for your sin or your bad choices. All right? So I don't bless you or forgive anything. You answer to him. To Jesus Christ. Don't worry about what I think. Worry about what he thinks. And he will put you in a situation that he knows. He'll give you the grace for your situation. But many times, I've been privy to this information from people. Well, our situation's different. My child's different. My finances are different. If they were like so-and-so's, then I could give. If my child was like this child, then I'd do that. If, if my job was like this, and, and there's always an excuse, right? It comes down to some three phrases there. One, I'll beat the odds. Second one, you don't know what I deal with. The last one there on the next page. There's a random blank there, I'm sorry. The last blank who cares? Top of the page there. Who cares? Or in our deceptive thoughts, we think this. This is good enough. Pastor, I'm pretty good compared to somebody else. I'm 85% in. I'm 90% in. What if I gave you a box of Fruit Loops that was 95% good but 5% rat poison? Would you take the chance? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. We're uncommitted. Let me quickly and I give you the correct response. There's some verses I want to read through them very briefly. Psalm 37, 5, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, he shall bring it to pass. Proverbs 16, verse 3, commit. What that, what those in both Psalm 37 and Proverbs 16. When it says commit, it means to roll yourself on. 
You know that if I roll myself on Jesus Christ, if I commit to that, when I commit, I'm all on him, not on me. All right, it's all him. Uh, commit, it's all in on that. Commit thy way, Psalm 37, Proverbs 16, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. We see the example of, of Christ in verse 16 of 1 John chapter 3. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What if Jesus Christ was half committed? What if Jesus Christ was 85% in? What if he was 98% in and went all the way to the cross, beaten, crown of thorns, and then said, and I'm taking a hard pass on this? Jesus Christ, he was all in, was he not? Perfect example for you and for me. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, Paul says this, I have fought a good fight, I have finished. I was committed. Finished my course, I have kept the faith. Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In John 14, verse 15, where Jesus said this, if ye love me, keep most. Keep some. Decide which ones are convenient and helpful and comfortable and hold on to those. And the other ones just kind of set to the side and let someone else do that. Now, if you love me, if you have a love for me, he says, keep my commandments. He doesn't qualify which ones. I'll give you three, three blanks there. Tonight to think about, to pray about, and to commit to. Number one, choose to commit to a life for God. Choose to commit to a life for God. Men, women, children, those are the sound of my voice, choose to commit to a life for God. little phrase there, all of me for all of him. All of me for all of him. Choose to commit to a life of God, to a life for God. Boy, there'd be some homes that would be different. When some dads say, I'll choose to commit to a life for God. There'd be some places of work. Some co-workers have a different co-worker tomorrow morning when a lady or a man shows up and now their life's committed to a life for God. Choose to commit to a life for God. Number two, choose to commit to a life to your mate. That's what we promise, is it not? That's what we promise. Number three, Choose to have a commitment in your life in spite of your circumstances. Now, I could have structured that just for parents, but I wanted to purposely make it broader. If you're a mom, then have commitment as a mom in spite of your circumstances. Well, I only have one arm. Well, then use your other arm with commitment. If you're dad... If you're called to serve, whatever the calling may be, do it with commitment in spite of your circumstances. I desire, the bottom last phrase, to be committed to God, my spouse, and my responsibilities. Tonight, a few moments while I have an invitation. We've not had one on these Wednesday nights. I've done this. Tonight I'm asking us, to be committed. Maybe tonight God's touched your heart. Whether you're a parent or not, as you can see, it goes far beyond that, does it not? Maybe tonight you need to say, Lord, I want to choose to be committed. I've been halfway. I've been 75%. Lord, be happy. Remember this morning, I've had good intentions, and I'm 95% there. No, no, Lord, 100%. And when I fall, when I falter, Lord, you'll give me the grace and strength to get back up. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Lord, thank you for this evening and for this time. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to be honest tonight. Lord, not honest between each other, but honest between you. And Lord, if there's those of us who need to commit or recommit to you, Lord, if you've revealed some areas, some ways that our commitment has waned, become weak, Lord, would we humbly come back to you with your grace, with your strength and power. If you're here tonight and God's touched your heart, you need to respond to him. Why don't you respond now? The altar is open. Respond the right way. Lord, may we have obedience in this invitation. Just stand to your feet, many praying now. You obey the Lord like He's touched your heart. Would you sing that with me? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning. Though no one joined me, still I will follow. Though no one joined me. Why do we do that? That last verse in that song, the world behind me, the cross before me. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The world behind me, the cross before me. Sing now, the world behind me, the cross before me. grace and for your strength and your mercy. Lord, well, you gave us a good, a, a good, Lord, a good service tonight. You met with us. Lord, I'm thankful for touching us, touching my heart, Lord, encouraging us, challenging us. Lord, may we go out changed and different. Lord, may we go out with a renewed commitment, desire to hold to you, cling to you. And Lord, mistakes that have been made, Lord, may they not discourage us. Lord, may they May they not distract us, but may we keep our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our, of our faith. Lord, knowing that you'll give us strength for tonight and for tomorrow. Lord, may we live for you, and would you take our feeble efforts, and would you do something great with them. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.